Welcome, I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin of the New York Times, and we welcome you to uh, the New York Times' Dealbook DC Policy Project. Over the next two days, uh, we're gonna have some remarkable conversations uh, with some of the most influential policymakers in the country and business leaders as we try to grapple uh, with the future of this country and the path forward at this historic crossroads in our history. And we couldn't be more thrilled uh, to begin this morning and to kick off these conversations uh, with the Treasury Secretary of the United States. Uh, Janet Yellen is here. Uh, we are thrilled to have her. I should tell you, uh, she is, of course, an accomplished economist. She was the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Clinton. Uh, she was the chair of the Federal Reserve, the first woman to do so, and she is now the first woman to be in this role as the Treasury Secretary. Uh, Madam Secretary, thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much for the invitation, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's great to see you. Um, I, I want to uh, get into the nitty gritty of policy and the way you're thinking about so much of what's going on in this country. But before we do that, I just have a very personal question, which is that when your name was first floated for this job, I remember thinking to myself, is she really going to want to take this job? She's done everything. She's already had a job in the White House. She's run the Fed. So take us inside for a moment, just the conversation you had around the dinner table with your husband, George, who I should say is also a Nobel winning economist who you've written many papers with uh, over the years about the decision to do this. Well, it was something I certainly hadn't expected to do with this stage in my career. And um, I was working at the Brookings Institution, writing about financial stability and uh, topics that really interest me. And it settled into a slightly less stressful life. And I remembered very well what being in the White House, being in administration in a senior position is like. It's a 24 seven job. Um, there's a lot of stress. The feeling of responsibility on one's shoulders is really enormous. And so I must say I was initially hesitant to get back into that. But look, um, when the president asked me if I'd do it and told me he thought I could be helpful to him at a crucial time like this for our country, when we have a pandemic, an economic crisis, and then as I expect we'll discuss, um, a set of longer term issues um, that have been facing this economy that really need to be addressed. I really couldn't say no. And uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad I'm part of this fantastic team. Well, what's so interesting, I think, about the role that you now uh, embody is uh, a really much more, a, a, almost a broader mandate for Treasury in terms of all of the different things uh, that you're going to be doing. And I want to talk about uh, climate inclusivity and so many things. But of course, the thing that's on your plate right now in front of all of us is this stimulus plan. And I wanted to ask you what you thought success looks like. If we were having this conversation together in a year or two from now, and we looked at the 1.9, uh, trillion dollars that, that, that may get spent under this plan. On the other side of it, you would say, these are the metrics with which we'll, we'll measure it. Well, first of all, we need to deal with the health crisis to get the pandemic back under control um, to achieve herd immunity so the economy can go back to operating in the normal way and people can feel secure. And so success on the public health front um, is a key metric that we're watching. But then as important, this pandemic has wreaked economic havoc um, for so many people in the country and particularly for lower income people and for minorities and minority businesses, small businesses. And we need to make sure that um, those who've been most affected aren't permanently scarred by this um, crisis, that they can go back to leading productive lives without having the crisis leave them in a situation where it will take a permanent toll on their lives and well being. And there are a lot of different metrics we can use to judge success in that. Um, a simple one would be. How long is it going to take us to get unemployment down to the levels we enjoyed prior to the crisis? You know, remember the unemployment rate was at a 50-year low of three and a half percent. 
Now it's at 6.3. Um, really, though, if you count, in addition to the almost 10 million who are registered as unemployed, if you add in the 4 million who have dropped out of the labor force um, for health reasons because they have childcare responsibilities, um, and 2 million people who have reduced hours or pay, we're looking at an unemployment rate that really is close to 10%. I would, success to me would be um, if we could get back to pre pandemic levels of unemployment and um, see the reemployment of those who have lost jobs in the service sector, particularly, um, I would also consider that a measure of success. Madam Secretary, how do you think about this? There are some critics who say that we are spending uh, money inefficiently, uh, that we want to get money to the most vulnerable, of course. But in the process of doing that, uh, we are building, a, a creating an asset bubble in certain cases, that there are people who are going to get money uh, that, ne- that shouldn't necessarily have access to that money. And I'm curious, just as a system, whether you think that there's an, a need for better financial infrastructure in this country so that you could get money to the most vulnerable uh, without using it in, in, in an inefficient way. What do you think of that? So I think the principle of wanting to get money to target it on those who've suffered the most is an important and valid principle. And the American Rescue Plan does that in many different ways through targeted food assistance, unemployment compensation, some rental assistance for low-income people who face eviction, and in other ways. And that's pretty well targeted. But the truth is, there are pockets of pain that go beyond um, what can be reached in those highly targeted ways. Take the example of uh, people who have had to drop out of the labor force because they have children who aren't in school. So they face a loss of income. Many are not eligible for unemployment insurance. It's important to Um, And some of those face food insecurity. You've got 24 million adults who say they don't have enough to eat, Um, 12 million children, um, 15 million people who are behind on their rent. And, um, you know, it's not so easy in a highly targeted way to help those people. So um, my view would be that the checks, for example, the $1,400 checks, Of course, we don't want those to go to very high income individuals and households who've been less affected. But that really helps to make sure that um, pockets of misery that we know exist out there that um, aren't touched by the more targeted things, that help is provided there as well. And I believe we're going to be better off for it and um, that it's, it's the right thing to do. Given the amount of debt, though, that this country has taken on, I'm curious how you think about that. Um, A reporter mentioned to me yesterday that that the Treasury Secretary's job uh, in some ways could be considered to be the the, the top uh, salesman for bonds in this country. When you think about the bond market and having to sell sell that debt to the public, uh, how do you think about that? Well, of course, a key job for a Treasury Secretary is to make sure our country is on a sound fiscal course. And look, if you don't spend what it's necessary to get the economy quickly back on track, that has a fiscal cost as well. Uh, A prolonged downturn in the economy, a very slow recovery, um, as we saw after the financial crisis, when there was some fiscal aid, but um, not nearly as much or for as long as was needed that took a fiscal toll as well. So by having a stronger economy, the money that's spent partially pays for itself. But the second thing I'd say that I really think is important is that we have been in a low interest rate environment now for a long time. Um, And not only since the pandemic and not only after the financial crisis, but interest rates have been drifting down Um, in the United States and also in most other developed countries. Look at Japan, look at the Euro area, look at most developed countries. Um, 
interest rates are really low. So if you look at traditional metrics um, concerning fiscal, the fiscal stance, debt to GDP ratios, yes, they've gone up in the United States and um, they've gone up quite a lot as a consequence of the uh, spending we've done to address the pandemic. Um, so, you know, that I remember back in 2007, the debt to GDP ratio before the financial crisis was 35%, and now it's around 100. But look at a different metric, which I think is a more important metric, which is what is the cost of that debt? Um, just look, for example, at interest payments on the debt as a share of GDP. And um, currently, that's under 2%, and it's no higher than it was in 2007. So I think we have more fiscal space than we used to because of the interest rate environment. And I think we should be using it now to address an emergency. Given that, let me ask you this. Would you ever consider issuing uh, a 100-year bond note as a result of where interest rates really are right now? Well, the um, Treasury is issuing longer-term securities. Um, and that's something that um, we have looked at and could look at again. But um, I think most people feel that the market for that would be very tiny. There might be some interest, but it would probably be a very thin market and with very limited interest. But um, issuing longer term securities um, certainly seems right. to make some sense. One, one question though, we do see what seems like an asset, I don't know if we're gonna call it an asset bubble, but assets have risen uh, considerably. How do you think about what took place in Japan in the late eighties as an economist, for example, and then the 20 years after and where we are right now? Well, in Japan, you had an enormous asset price bubble affecting both the stock market and real estate. And when it burst, it was a financial crisis and it took a toll on the Japanese economy for a very long time. Um, I think we, we saw something not identical, but similar um, in the run up to the 2008 financial crisis. And we tried to learn some lessons from the Japanese experience. And I think we did. Um, one, one thing we learned is to intervene to make sure that financial, major financial institutions, banks recapitalize quickly and then are in a position to support the economy. And I'm sure you remember the stress tests and the TARP and the injection of capital um, into the banking system. And the consequence of that is that in this pandemic, the banks have done very well. We have been left with a much stronger core financial system. Banks have been able to um, support the economy throughout this pandemic. Um, this is a very, the, the, there was a huge amount of turbulence in March as um, the pandemic caused right. a global um, rush to cash, but there were very effective interventions. And, you know, f finances, um, with the exception of small businesses that are really having a tough time um, finding the financing that they need, right. um, major companies are, are really have huge access, easy access well, to credit now. To, to that point, and we've seen the stock market rise and a lot of uh, beneficiaries as a result during this pandemic, I, I know later this year you're going to uh, be announcing uh, a tax plan. Uh, the administration has talked about that, and, and you've even talked about uh, it being graduated, meaning, meaning it'll, 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 it'll slowly come out over time um, or be implemented over time. I'm curious what you think of something like a, a financial tax, um, given, given the success of the stock market uh, relative to other parts of the economy. Well, I think that's something that one would have to examine closely what impact it would have on ordinary um, retail customers who are active in the stock market. Um, it, could deter spec it could deter speculation, but it might also have negative impacts. Um, so it's something I think that's worth looking at. But um, what President Biden has indicated is that He's going to be looking 
um, at corporate taxation, cl closing loopholes, um, trying to um, probably raise the corporate tax rate, um, not as high as it was before 2017, but probably up to 28% to try to get rid of subsidies for fossil fuels and um, un other un inefficient forms of taxation. So does that mean you don't think we'll see a wealth tax? Well, you know, a wealth tax has been discussed, but it's not something that President Biden um, has come out in favor of. I think it's something that has very difficult implementation problems. Um, but, um, you know, President Biden has pledged not to raise taxes on uh, households making less than $400,000. But, um, you know, for example, their um, capital gains uh, escape taxation, even in death due to step up of basis, that might be something that's um, worth reconsidering. So you think the step up in basis, I've been writing about the issue, uh, the issue of carried interest. I think I first started writing about it in 2007. Do you, do you think that's going to get, uh, get, get worked out this year? Well, I think that's something that certainly deserves to be on the list of um, things to look at. Um, separately, I, 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 there's so much to talk to you about. I, I, I know that you've been asked about a million times in recent weeks about Bitcoin. Um, and I'm not going to ask you about it because I, I, I've heard your answer. But I have a different question that relates to actually digital currency and, and the idea of a digital dollar and whether you think that the United States needs to be looking into this. According to uh, Harvard and the Atlantic Council, 70 different countries, uh, their central banks are looking into a digital dollar. Do you think it's important? Well, I think it makes sense for central banks to be looking at it. And I'm aware that the Federal Reserve is looking at it. Um, they're, um, I, I gather that people at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston are working with researchers at MIT to um, study the properties of it. Um, you know, we do have a problem with financial inclusion. Uh, too many Americans really don't have access to easy payment systems and to banking banking accounts. And I think, you know, this is something that a digital dollar, a central bank digital currency could help with. Um, and, it, you know, I, I think it could result in faster, safer and cheaper payments, right. um, which I think are important goals. But there are a set of issues around central bank digital currencies that have to be examined. What would be the impact on the banking system? Would it cause a huge movement of deposits out of um, banks and into the Fed? Um, would the Fed deal with retail customers or try to do this at a wholesale level? Um, are there financial stability concerns? How would we manage um, money laundering and illicit finance issues? So there's a lot to consumer right. protection, How, a lot to consider here, but it's absolutely worth looking at. Um, I, I, I know that you, you worried about um, fraud when it comes to, to Bitcoin. Let me ask you actually just one related Bitcoin question, which is that it's now as a market cap of over a trillion dollars. Is there a point at which it becomes important to you in the context of the U.S. economy? Meaning, is there, is there a price at which you say to yourself, I need to really be all over this, either as a commodity or potentially as something to think about in the context of a currency? So I don't think that Bitcoin, I've said this before, is widely used as a transaction mechanism to the extent it's used I fear it's um, often for illicit finance. Um, it's an extremely inefficient way of um, conducting transactions and the amount of energy that's consumed in processing those transactions is staggering, but it is a highly speculative asset. And, um, you know, I think people should, should beware um, it it's, can be extremely volatile, and um, you know I do worry. I do worry about potential losses that investors in it could suffer. Um, I wanted to 
uh, pivot the conversation, talk a little bit about climate, because I know that's something that's important to you and how you're thinking about the economy. We've seen a number of large companies over the past 12 months announce some very aggressive and ambitious plans uh, around uh, carbon and getting to carbon neutral. Uh, my, my question to you is, do you think it can be done on an idiosyncratic market basis, meaning companies are going to do this on their own, or do you ultimately think it requires regulation? Well, it certainly requires policy. Um, you know, President Biden has endorsed the idea of um, tax credits for electric vehicles. And, um, you know, when the pandemic is under control and this package has been passed, um, the president is going to turn his attention to his Building Back Better agenda, which will include investments in the grid and in um, stations to, um, to recharge electric vehicles, uh, more efficient um, carbon, carbon emission reducing um, transportation uh, in many parts of the United States. So this does require um, investments by the government, but investments by the private sector are going to be tremendously important. And I find, find it exciting that so many American companies are recognizing that climate change is something we really have to deal with meaningfully um, in the coming decade. Um, the president has endorsed a policy of net zero by 2050, similar to other advanced countries. Um, and so, thinking about what information do investors need about companies' um, emissions and their strategies for dealing with emissions. A lot of progress has been made on that. Many companies have signed on voluntarily to disclosure. Um, there's a growing sustainable investment movement um, that I think there's the potential there for private investments that will facilitate um, carbon emissions reductions. And, um, you know, there, there's a new movement now toward stress testing of financial institutions, the recognition right. that financial institutions um, can be affected, that climate change creates risks, both physical risks, but also risks due to um, price changes, stranded assets and the like. And I mean, I found it encouraging that the Federal Reserve has indicated that it's looking at, at this. And I think that's something that at Treasury, we may be able to discuss and facilitate in the United States. Is that something that you anticipate doing, meaning stress test? Do you imagine Treasury working on a stress test for the banks? And, and do you think that the, the banks currently, I mean, what, what would they have to do to pass the test if, if, they, if, if you decide that, for example, they have too much exposure uh, to, to companies that, that are not going to, to, to fit the criteria? So I don't envision the Treasury doing stress tests. I mean, it would be the Federal Reserve and other regulators, um, conceivably um, insurance regulators may also want to do stress tests. Um, and I think it's not envisioned that this would have the same, these tests would have the same status in terms of limiting payouts and capital requirements, but I think they would be very revealing um, to both to regulators and to the firms themselves uh, in terms of managing their own risks. Right. Um, separately, you've talked a lot about inclusion. You've been a, a role model and a champion for women. I'm curious about your take on um, what we're starting to see in corporate America when it comes to boards of directors. Um, the state of California um, has a law now in place that requires every board to have uh, at least two, uh, two diverse candidates. Uh, the NASDAQ recently announced uh, and filed uh, to the SEC a request so that uh, two of two, any, any company on its exchange would need to have two uh, diverse candidates. Goldman Sachs saying it won't take companies public uh, without it. Do you think there should be a law in place federally? I don't know if there needs to be a law, but there, diversity is certainly an important goal. And I'm pleased to see um, companies give it greater attention in their own planning and the initiatives that you 
mentioned, I find heartening because although opportunities have in, increased, and I guess I'm an example of it. And I remember when I was sworn in a couple of weeks ago, it was by the vice president. Um, and, you know, I think some decades ago, you wouldn't have seen a woman treasury right. secretary or um, a black woman vice president. So there's been some progress. But look, if you look at the broader statistics, um, women, the further up you go in the leadership ranks, uh, the less they're represented. And um, this is true in business. It's true on Wall Street. And I, it's costly. First of all, I, I think it's unfair. And second of all, in terms of the performance of organizations, there's a great deal of research that shows that organizations that are diverse do perform better in a whole variety of ways. So uh, this is an important goal and it's top of mind to me at Treasury where promoting diversity and inclusion will be a key objective. Okay, a couple quick, uh, very quick questions. Um, just a broad market question. I had a conversation with Ken Griffin after this GameStop situation last week about whether the markets are unto themselves are fair. This whole situation sort of turned everything upside down to me at least because we've always had investor protections for small investors, but now the investors are saying, don't protect me. In fact, your protection is, means you're protecting the hedge fund guys. And so I'm, I'm curious whether you think that, that my mother has the same shot to do as well as Ken Griffin. Well, you know, Ken is somebody who um, is very savvy about the markets and has opportunities um, that probably your mother and I don't have. But it's really important that investors, including at the small retail level, um, are treated fairly and have opportunities to trade in the markets. And, um, you know, that's one of the issues that um, we need to look at. Um, be, because of the GameStop and other turmoil. Uh, I met with senior regulators. The SEC is going to prepare a report. We need to understand in detail the facts of the matter. But um, are investors sufficiently well-informed and protected? I think that's, that's a really important question. And it's too soon to draw conclusions, but uh, that's an important goal. And final question for you, Madam Secretary. Uh, I know that the administration is committed uh, to get behind uh, the uh, new design of the $20 bill uh, with Harriet Tubman. Can you just explain something to me? Why is it taking so, why does it take so long? Um, my 10-year-old my son asked me the question, so I thought I'd ask you. Well, you know, when a new um, issue of currency is produced, um, it's important that there be you know, currency is very highly technologically sophisticated and counterfeiting is a tremendously important issue. Um, the technology incorporated in currency evolves over time and usually new currency is not issued until there have been sufficient advances in anti-counterfeiting technology. And it's a highly... Um, it's a complicated manufacturing process. So it takes longer to issue a new currency, um, a new set of bills right. than you would imagine. But I promise I will do everything I possibly can to expedite this. And I would love to see Harriet Tubman um, honored on, um, honored on our currency. Um, we should let you go. But before I do, I have, I have one other thing I should ask you. We're going to be talking to Letitia James uh, from New York State in just, in just a little bit later today. And so one of the questions is, is the Treasury Department, in your mind, legally required to comply with congressional requests these days uh, for presidential tax returns? It's something the country has been grappling with now, I think, for the last four years. So I will seek um, legal advice on this. And um, follow the law. Fair enough. Um, it's a fair answer. Uh, we, we will see the answer soon. Uh, Madam, Madam, Madam Secretary, you thank you so very much for joining us, for helping us kick off uh, this conversation today. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much. My pleasure, Andrew.
And uh, we have a series of uh, conversations. Letitia James and others are going to be joining us uh, throughout the day. Uh, so many others, Ed Bastian from Delta will be with us, along with Steve Bomber. And then tomorrow we have the CEO of CVS uh, on the vaccine rollout. Uh, we'll also be talking to Vlad Tenev, the CEO of uh, Robinhood, uh, along with uh, the former uh, commissioner, uh, chairman rather, of the SEC. And then Mitt Romney uh, will be spending some time with us as well. We hope you'll join all of those conversations. I want to thank you. Uh, for joining us now and we'll see you in just a little bit.